Hey everyone, I'm not working for the next two weeks and I didn't really plan this out ahead. I spontaneously took the days off because I basically couldn't go on any further. And so my body sent a warning signal and said like, okay, we need to take the vacation now, not in the two weeks when you had planned to take them. So I don't have any travel plans. I don't really have any plans at all, except for a lot of resting and relaxing maybe exercise a lot and a lot of reading and catching up on things. But what my main goal for this vlog and also for my vacation is, is to attack my physical TBR. Now, you know, I don't have a big TBR anymore, but I have had these three books in my physical TBR for most of the year now. And I keep putting them off because I'm not in the right frame of mind to read and don't have enough time to invest in the books that I think they might need. And also, yeah, basically reading more than just a page a day. That's not just plot consumption. So what books am I talking about? Let's start with Lavona. Lavona is the latest book by Motessa Oshvac. I loved all her other books. I waited for this to come out in paperback and then it came out, I think in May in Germany, and I bought it. And ever since then, it's been lying in my TBR, waiting for me to get in the right mind frame to pick it up. The next book is a German book, Glitterschnitter by Sven Regner. And I actually read most of his other works. I think, I think I've read all of them. And I'm not even sure if this is in the same setting that the other books are around Frank Lehmann. Who knows? I will find out. This has been in my TBR for quite a while now. The last book is going to be the biggest challenge and I'm not even sure if I'm going to get to that because it's Only Revolutions by Mark Z. Danielewski. And as you can see, it has two covers. When we look in the inside, it's just uh, Mark Z. Danielewski. You, you just don't know how to read this stuff. I have the suspicion that maybe you can start either way, either go this way or this way. But I will look further into that as soon as I start it. But to have it easy, I'm starting with the biggest book, but also the one I probably expect to read the fastest because Glitterschnitter will be in German. I can read a little bit faster in German than I can do in English. And I'm expecting more a plot driven story than challenging reading or I don't even know what Lavona is about. I forgot. Who knows? I'll find out. Anyways, this is what I'll start with. And because I'm an unreliable narrator, I spent the whole day yesterday rereading Gris Grimley's Frankenstein. I really enjoyed this. I read Frankenstein, the whole text years ago. It took me forever. I found it very boring, but I was glad I finally read it. But this version, it's a graphic novel. It contains the original text, but it doesn't have all of it. Some boring parts, let's say like that, are just images. So I think it works better if you have read the original text and you know the story, but it also works really fine in getting back into the story and highlighting different parts of it and different parts of the text. So I really enjoyed that. I have a full review of this when I first read it, so I'm going to link that below. But I yeah, finished the first book in my vacation that was not Glitterschnitter. I am still reading Glitterschnitter. I'm about 170 pages in, so 300 more to go let you know how I think about it when I'm done. And I finished Glitterschnitter. So as I expected, this is the fifth book in the Frank Lehmann series, or rather a book about the Frank Lehmann characters. The first one I definitely know is translated into English, Berlin Blues, which is the one I think is best. Glitterschnitter is more or less picking up where Wiener Straße left off. We kind of see in this book a new set of characters. We see Frank Lehmann really fresh in Berlin and making friends, trying to find his place, settle in and meeting a lot of artists. So this book is a lot about performance art and a group of characters just having wild things happening. And Glitterschnitter is more of the same. I constantly felt like 
back at university where you had all these artsy friends, people who are in a band, people who are in theater, and you see them mostly at random parties and they tell you what's been going on. It's a lot of back and forth dialogue and a lot of showing off, being silly, stupid, and thinking a lot of yourself, kind of, but in a kind of addictive way. It's when I remember those times, this is what this book felt like. The book is set in 1980s West Berlin, so it's before the wall came down, when it's still in the Cold War, and it was a little island. It was Everything was different there. So it puts you in this spot where you're trapped a little bit, but you could also do a lot of things that you couldn't do anywhere else, and it gives back this feeling. The book is just taking you along on a wild ride. You're trapped in the dialogues, in the events of the performance artist. Glitter Schnitter is a band and they want to be part of this festival that's going on, this art festival, music festival, and so they are trying to audition and play a concert, and it's all about that. The event or the plot, I think, is less what this book is about. It's more about the people, the dialogue, and the performance artist in itself. I don't find it as funny as other people say. I'm just more nostalgic about hanging out with people you hardly ever see and listening to their plans and ideas and just being on the sideline nodding, okay, yeah, and that's that. I enjoyed it just as I did the other books. Not as much as Hellimann, the first one, Berlin Blues. So maybe pick up with that one if you are interested. And I'm done with La Vona. I highly enjoyed this, mostly the writing. The writing just made me fly through it. and. That's what I expected. When it comes to the story, I'm not exactly sure why I have in mind that there was an either hate or love relationship with the book. I can see why people maybe don't understand it or don't enjoy it, but I'm not exactly sure what they were so disgusted by it. As far as I remember, disgust was one of the main complaints. I need to look that up. So what is Lavona about? Lavona is basically the name of a small village and it's Oh, let's say set somewhere in medieval times. It's not specifically said what time it is, but it doesn't feel very modern, but more medieval. And the people are very religious in this town. They have their beliefs and their beliefs and their religion is governing their days and their lives. The story follows the people of the town and the course of events for about a year. The chapters are spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, so there is about the story. And one of the main characters that we follow is the son of the lamb herder, and he's crippled and disfigured, and so has a lot of difficulties. Also, his father is very violent and keeps beating him up and not very loving. But that doesn't matter because the son, Marek, believes that this is part of his punishment in life so he can come to heaven faster or sooner. That is part of what the villagers believe, that you have to be pious and not eat meat and really not be happy so much. They don't say it, but there is a lot of focus on the beliefs and how the villagers are on the one side organizing their lives by it, but are also organized and oppressed by the Lord William who lives up on the mountain in a manor and there's also a lot of events going on there a huge part of the story plays there i don't want to give away too much but it is really fascinating to see the people the characterizations the events that are happening the life how it is different in the manor and in the villages and how the belief in god and the way the people believe in god shapes their lives and I really like that about the book. When it comes to the story itself, I'm not yet sure what it wanted to tell me. It was a blast to read. I really enjoyed that. I always enjoy Otessa Moschweck's writing. I really enjoy how they puts how she puts together sentences and describes people and the people she described. They're not happy people. They're not enviable people. They're not even likable people, but she always makes them depict in a way that you can't not read about them. Does that make sense? Probably not. 
Anyways, I highly enjoyed my reading of La Vona. I'm quite happy and very content that I finally picked it up and also that I picked it up with so much time to spend with it without having to put it down all the time so I could fly through it. Now I have one week left of vacation and I accidentally went book shopping the other day. So now I have two physical books. I originally set out with only revolutions on my TBR, but now I also own She Who Became the Sun. And I'm a little bit torn what I want to read next. I know that Only Revolutions will give me a interesting and enjoyable reading experience for the way it was written. I have no idea what the story even is about or what it does, this book. But I know I will love the writing. Whereas I'm expecting that She Who Became the Sun will be a fun, fast-paced adventure. I have no clue what this is about either, but there's a dragon on the cover, so what can go wrong? And everybody is raving about this book. So, I have no clue what will happen because I'm gonna go on a walk now. Well, that was unexpected. I didn't sleep half the night because it was too dark, so I finally finished Beauty and Cruelty. This is a book I started of weeks ago and I've been on and off reading it. I haven't been enjoying it much because I mostly fell asleep on it and then I put it aside for a while after I basically had half of it read and I finished the rest last night and I'm glad I finally finished it and yeah it's just a meh book. I picked up the book because I like the cybernetic tea shop by the same author very much and this sounds like something I would really enjoy. Well, as far as I looked into it in advance, I think I expected a retelling of Sleeping Beauty, which it kind of is, I'm not sure. So the story basically goes that the fairy tales all have their own realm and because people, like we people, don't believe in them anymore, the energy and the world is collapsing, sort of. So some fairy tale creatures like Cruelty, who is the evil witch in Sleeping Beauty, is living in the real world and doing menial jobs and reading books to charge her energy. So all of that sounds really cool and it was really fun. So we mostly follow Cruelty along, how she's narrating the story and giving us purpose on what's going on and background and she's moving between the fairy tale realm and our world and Sleeping Beauty can manifest herself so even though she's lying there sleeping she has a ghost-like image that is hovering and being able to talk to and she has come up with this plan to make people believe in fairy tales more again and that's the part I didn't really get. So the plan is to capture and kidnap humans into the realm and then make them believe and send them back. It's that part really doesn't work. I don't understand it all the way through. The rest of the idea is that it addresses a lot of factors how fairy tales are not speaking to everyone as they are basically limited in their character choice to white heterosexuals and that there's a lot of population that doesn't feel or identify with the fairy tale and thus cannot create the belief that the fairy tale archetypes they're called need. So Sleeping Beauty is an archetype story and Beauty and the Beast is also in there as an archetype story and it is bound by and how the characters are bound by their stories. All of that sounds really really interesting and cool and it just didn't work. I think mostly because I didn't get the plan with getting humans into the realm and then sending them back without doing anything with them. Overall I am not giving up on the author, but I cannot recommend this book, honestly. Even though it has a lot of great ideas, it wasn't a joy for reading. Yeah. And that's that already, the last day of my vacation. I started both of these books, but didn't finish either. She Who Became the Sun is not as much fun as I expected. I'm a little under halfway through the book. I really enjoyed the first part. It was exactly what I expected, a fast-paced, fun story, and I was engaged in the main character's life and how she got to the monastery and tried to survive there and got educated and the things happening there. But then the second part introduced more of being part of the ongoing war and being in battles 
and also new perspectives. And I'm not exactly sure if it's the new characters and points of views that I don't like, the way they are written, because it feels a little bit different than from the points of view or from the narration we had in the monastery, or if it's just the content of being part of the fight and the different perspectives and also the different factions and what they are aiming for. If that's a little bit dragging for me right now. I'm still enjoying it, but it's not as fast paced and adventurous as I had hoped. I'm also a little bit confused by the use of names because a lot of times the author or the characters are referred to by their last name and not their full name or their first name. And I've never seen that used before. I'm not completely sure if I just never noticed this or this is unusual for this book, but I'm a little confused by that. So if anyone knows why that is, let me know in comment. For only revolutions, it's a little bit harder to say how far I'm in. As you can see, I'm using three bookmarks because this story is told from two perspectives, one starting from this side and the other from this side. And then there's also a third timeline, let's say, that winds around or wraps around the text going one way only and not from both directions, if that makes sense. And I started reading both perspectives of the characters and it's an onslaught of words. It's a road novel and it feels a lot like road novels in the end 90s, early century. I mean, it's from 2006. So it feels in that kind of tone that road novels had back then. A lot of violence, a lot of sex, a lot of gruesome things happening fast paced. And I'm thinking of a Nicolas Cage movie that I can't remember what it's called, but think of something like that. It's really fast paced, a lot of words. The writing is not prose per se. It feels chopped off and more poetic, but not the kind I'm enjoying right now. I think I would have enjoyed this book a lot more if I had read it when it came out and I was more into the road novel narration. The other thing I'm not completely on board with or get is the timeline. It is not written out in like on this day, this happened. It's more a little slip of text for a year and then on the next page it's another year and it's just the words. And I feel that you have to have a lot of knowledge about what happened in that time to actually follow the text. So it's supposedly interacting with each other and we have these two teenagers on this road trip and it's supposed to be a love story, but yeah, I'm not completely sure when I'm finishing this, but not prioritizing it right now. Before I let you go, I also want to tell you about the audiobooks I listened to. When I started my vacation, I still had a few hours left in Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which I enjoyed, even though I expected to enjoy it more. This is following a young Chinese American girl who's coming out or discovering her own identity as lesbian and it's set in the 1950s. It's moving back and forth, giving us some background around the history of Chinese Americans and her family and how they got to be where they are. It's looking at the situation for lesbians and Chinese immigrants in the 1950s and things that were happening there in the political area, but also in the perception or acceptance of being lesbian Chinese. and. I enjoyed most of the narration. The audiobook was really, really well done. Emily Wuzella is amazing at narrating audiobooks. I can always recommend her. And also the way the story is told is captivating. But towards the end, I felt it dragged on a little bit and lost my interest. But that doesn't change the fact that I'm probably not one who needs to listen to this book or read this book and that it can mean a lot of different things to other people and more to other people as well. So if you're interested, I would recommend trying it. The next book I listened to was a slog, really. It was the last part of the Jules Verne collection that I had. It's Mysterious Island. And I did not know that this was a book about people being stranded on an island. I thought there was something else happening than them just building up, yeah, a living and a colony and 
just trying to survive and a lot of talk of what they do. It's these five people, it's how they got to the island, it's how they survived on the island, things they do. I think they're there for three years roundabout and the events happening. It's probably more interesting to other people who are more interested in the survival skills and how they just build everything from scratch and the talk they have about the farming, the technologies they need and everything. I just was a little bit bored and yeah, I'm glad I finally finished the Jules Verne collection. So that's checked off. And I'm also quite glad that I listened to this because I don't think I could have ever read this because it was too boring. But on audio, I can sit through it much better. The last book I haven't finished either. I'm about two hours left in Monkey King, which is a newer translation and I'm enjoying this very much. The book starts off telling us the difference to the original text and this translation because it is, even though the audiobook is an unabridged audiobook, the original text the translation is abridged because it didn't take the, uh, what is it, 100 chapters, 1000 page long text of the original, but it shortened it down to make it more palatable and accessible for modern readers. And it also explained what it left out. A lot of the repetitions that are due to the oral history of the stories themselves and also some of the stories, I forgot which ones, but it shortened down the book to bring back or only give back most of the essential part. So Monkey King, if you don't know, is a story from Chinese myth and folklore. And the book that is translated or referred to is from the 1500 something, but the stories first appeared around 600 something. And I've come across the character of Monkey King in varying forms of literature, movies and series that I've been curious about it for a while and I honestly got this audiobook in a two-for-one sale so I moved it up in my reading list a little bit and I'm enjoying it very much. It's very fun to see the stories that other stories that I've read and heard of or come across the character of Monkey King before and see what they are building upon. So I can see some of the stories and appearances of the character that I've met before and can see where the basic stories or the original material comes from. So for that, it's very interesting. I also enjoy the narration very much. And like I said, I have about two hours left and I can highly recommend this if you have ever been interested in the character of Monkey King and have seen him around and never really knew its origins or the original stories of his myth and character. So that's fun for that. And that was that. I have to go back to work tomorrow, so reading is going to slow down again. But I'm quite happy with all the books I read on my vacation. I hope you enjoyed the vlog and me talking about the books and things that I read. And let me know in comments if you've read any of the books I talked about, are interested in any of them, can recommend similar things of the ones I liked. And yeah, let's talk in comments. Thank you all for watching. Bye bye.